You have your Bibles with you this morning? Or as Raj would say, your phones or your devices or your <laughs> other equipment that you might have with you. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11 would be the place you'd want to turn to. The title of this morning's message, as you can see from looking at the screen, is When Faith Says No. We always think of people saying yes to Jesus, but this is really a little different this morning. We're going to talk about the fact that faith says no often as well and needs to. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can fellowship together. We thank you that you've already begun doing a work in our hearts this morning with the beautiful music and the songs that brought us to your throne. Some of us came in here and our hearts were a little hard or a little chilly from our week, from the world, whatever it might be, but we're warming, Lord. And we're looking forward to your spirit planting truth in our heart, watering it with your love and grace so that it'll grow and produce fruit in our church, in our homes, in our community, in our lives. So good to know you, Lord. We just love you so much. You're such a faithful father, such an amazing savior. such a strong spirit that strengthens us that we might do your will, your way. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone agreed by saying amen. amen. Well, it's almost 52 years now since I stood rather rigidly in front of a Methodist minister who proceeded to ask me a question. He looked straight in my eye. Eyes, I had two eyes. <laughs> and he said to me, Al, will you take Rebecca to be your lawfully wedded wife? Will you have and hold her from this day forward, for better, for worse? whether you're rich or poor, in sickness or in health, so long as you both shall live. My answer was immediate. It was bold, and it was determined. And I said, yes, sir. I didn't say I do. I said, yes, sir. I had just recently been discharged from the Marine Corps. <laughs> but that really wasn't the reason. I was just being strong and determined. Later, some jokingly said that I declared, yes, sir, just a smidgen too loud. That may be true. But I wanted Rebecca and that Methodist minister and her parents and my father and stepmother and all that were there to know that I meant business, that I was going to love this lady and she'd be my wife forever. I remember that very clearly. You see, by saying yes, sir, I was saying aloud to everyone that she would be my one and only love in life. By declaring yes, I was promising also no to anyone else. I suppose actually by affirming yes so boldly, I was saying no to many other things as well. And now, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, as I must, 
I've always tried to do the same with Jesus. I said yes to Jesus. You see, when I said yes to Jesus, it obligated me to say no to other gods. And of course, to say no to the carnal things of this world. Man, I'm a long ways from being perfect. But I got to tell you, I try. I'm still trying. But somehow, as a very young believer, I knew this truth. What I was doing that night that I gave my life to Christ was I was promising to do my best to seek first the kingdom of God. Later, I would learn that Jesus was very clear that we can't serve two masters. He gave a great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and mammon. Of course, mammon means most literally money, but generally we talk about mammon as the things of the world. So my point in telling you this is that I believe that faith in Christ requires an I do, a yes sir. I believe it requires a pledge of allegiance to God. And anything less is a bit of a compromise because he laid it all down for us. So if I'm going to say yes to Jesus, I'm going to mean it. I'm going to say yes to Jesus. I like the story of Abraham. I think he's a perfect example. He's a case in point. When Abraham exercised faith and believed God, which he's heralded for in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul, he said, yes, I'll go to the land of Canaan. And at the same time, he was saying no to Ur of Chaldee. In other words, Abraham declared yes to faith in God and no to idolatry. Yes to walking in obedience with Jehovah and no to the carnal world of idolatry. And what's interesting, when he said, yes, I'll go to Canaan, he didn't ask God for a, just a little out clause. Can I just accept for... He didn't try to negotiate with God, didn't try to draw up a contract. He didn't suggest to God, well, I'll go there, but along the way, there might be some potential, you know, compromises I need to make. Is that okay? He didn't ask God for a little time to kind of think about it. He simply said yes to God and no to the heathens of earth. It took both decisions, yes and no, to make him the man of faith, the father of our faith, that we all admire. Now, being in the ministry for a long time, I've discovered that it's easy, relatively easy, to say yes to God. It's a bit harder, as life marches on, to say no to the world and the flesh, and the devil. I'm not saying the devil's lurking around every corner, but you know what I mean. For example, thinking about Abraham, how about Lot, his nephew? He said yes to God, you know, pretty well at the start. But he didn't say no to the world and the sin of Sodom permanently. Lot's yes was okay, but it wasn't an undying commitment. And as a result, the story of his life ends, sadly, in a cave. Darkness 
drunkenness, lasciviousness, even depravity. You see, clearly his initial yes was not a fully determined yes. You say, well, that was the Old Testament. Okay, well, how about the Apostle Paul? He'll give us an illustration. He had a buddy, a friend, a fellow brother. His name was Demas. He said yes to God, too, rather enthusiastically, serving with Paul. But later, when he was being tested, he failed to say no to the world and to the flesh. Paul was in prison. You remember that. He urgently needed some support from other Christians. He was lonely. He just needed somebody to come and pray with him and love on him a little bit. And Demas, his former friend, failed him. And so Paul, remembering this, he writes to Timothy. And he says, Timothy, whatever you do, use Demas as a lesson as to what not to do. And these are the words he wrote about Demas. He's forsaken me. He loved this present world. And he's departed both from God and me for Thessalonica. You see, Demas said yes, but his yes wasn't determined enough, and it kind of withered down to a no. There's a lot of stories like that in the Bible. You know that. And whenever you read them, they're always a sad commentary. And I know that you also know this is true. Many people join the ranks of the faithful. They join up, yep, only to fall by the wayside because a time came when their early yes actually turned out to be more like a, well, yeah, maybe. They didn't really make a pledge. It wasn't really a big enough deal to them. Now, in all fairness to them, maybe because that's, they didn't realize how overwhelming the cross and the blood and the resurrection of Jesus Christ actually is. But nevertheless, their yes was sort of a maybe, and then when times got a little tricky, we lost contact with them. See, Jesus told the story, the parable of the sower, and it was absolutely true. He said something like, well, the seed of the word often falls on shallow soil, and it initially looks pretty good. It starts to grow, but then that initial yes turns to a no, and the cares of this world, Jesus says, chokes out the plant, and it dies, and it never produces any fruit. And in that story, what's interesting is there's never much talk about it being resurrected again. Faith in Jesus Christ requires a solemn pledge to God. It's a pledge of allegiance to God. And anything less than that, I can tell you from experience, will lead to compromise. And compromise leads to regression. That's why Jesus was so clear, again, from the Sermon on the Mount. He said, let your yes be yes. And your no, we know. A lukewarm yes isn't sufficient. A shaky yes almost invariably is destined for a no and for a failure. I know you all agree with me. You've heard that before and you've seen it before many times. Now, here... In our passage this morning, the Christians in the Jerusalem church, man, they started off like a ball of fire. Day of Pentecost, thousands came to Christ. And as Raj was just teaching us all, what, not too long ago, in Acts chapter 2 and verses 42 and 3 and 4 and on, and praying together, eating together, learning the apostles' doctrine together, Miracles, sharing, everything is wonderful. So they started off great. They said yes and amen to the gospel of God. But now a little bit of time has gone by. And many of them were 
sort of failing to stand up and say no against the legalism of Judaism that was creeping into the church. They were attempting to hold on to both legalism and grace, and it wasn't working because legalism and grace are diametrically opposed to one another, and they're pulled by a magnet away from each other, and so it was splitting and dividing the church. It was terrible. And as a result, their sweet walk with Jesus, for many of them, was being compromised. The gospel of grace, which is what is our bread and butter as Christians, was breaking down. And Paul was worried. How about you? Do you know people whose initial yes wasn't strong and determined? Do you? Shake your heads, yes or no? Yes or no? Yeah, you do. I'm sure most of you do. So today we're going to read for a few moments about the kind of faith that says yes and sticks by the decision. A faith that says no to the world and holds fast to that no, regardless of the challenge. One thing we need to remember, we can make all the pledges and all the promises in the world, but if we're not asking God the Holy Spirit to empower us, our promises will be shallow. We need God the Holy Spirit. If there's anything I'm convinced of in the church today, the 21st century church, is we need the power of God's Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the spiritual gifts in operation. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So keep that in mind. So Moses is going to be our model. Look at verse number 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. Her name was Jochebed. That's Moses' mother. She had already given birth to a couple of children. You'll recognize their name, Aaron and Miriam. So those two children were already living when Pharaoh issued this dastardly decree. All male babies born to the Israelites from now on will be drowned in the River Nile. Now obviously Jochebed understood that this was a Wicked, evil, from the pit of hell kind of decree. And in faith, she said no to that. I'm not giving up my baby to the soldiers. She seemed to know that there was something special about Moses. Maybe she just sensed it. Of course, she loved her baby, but maybe she sensed that there was something to this child and what his life might become. A revelation from God to Jochebed, maybe Amram, his father as well. Insight that God had a very distinct and unique plan for his life. Just as God has a very distinct and unique plan for my life and your life and the lives of our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. According to Acts chapter 7, Stephen declared the child Moses was lovely in the sight of the Lord. That doesn't mean he was just a cute little baby. The key words were in the sight of the Lord. Lovely means wonderful and magnificent, and he's going to be something. Something's going to happen with this child. So Jacobed and Amram had to make a decision and it required strong faith, but they did it, and they saved Moses. They said yes to God and God's plan for Moses and said an absolute no in defiance of Pharaoh's edict. They believed that God would take care of Moses. They believed that God would take care of them, I'm sure. And it took courage to disobey Pharaoh. And now here's the truth. Faith that says no 
to the things of this world that you and I all see and are troubled with. Faith to say no to this world takes bravery. It takes strength. It takes some courage. Now, maybe they remembered Jacobet and Amram, the prophecies of Joseph, and <coughs> he had prophesied that a deliverer would come and rescue the children of Israel. Whatever they knew or really didn't know, whatever happened to them, God the Holy Spirit did something in their heart, and they said yes to the promises of God and no to Pharaoh, in spite of the fact that they would be in a great minority just as we are today in a minority. It was a time of tension. It was a time of trouble in Egypt. It's a time of tension and trouble in America today as well, isn't it? I mean, it's unbelievable. Some of you were my age. Some of you were younger. Some of you a smidge older. Can you remember a time when our nation, the United States of America, was so divided? And how loud and vocal the progressives have become, the extreme left, and what they demand as their rights. And few, if any, people are afraid to say, wait a minute, that's not right. Well, the only light there is in the world is you. The only salt that's on the planet is us that I know of. It took courage to hide Moses for three months and then put him in a little basket and float him away on the Nile River. You see, the Bible shows us that there are times, and especially now in the last days, when our faith is going to be tested. And I believe it's really being tested now. I think about my grandsons. You know, even my older grandsons, Nikolai and Quincy, you know, and David and a few other. They're being tested like I've never been tested before. They're just sort of heading out into the workforce, you know, and into the world. It's going to be tested. But we as Christians, we're called to be courageous and strong. We're not supposed to be weak and timid. We're supposed to be strong. Strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, of course. So if you're going to say yes to Jesus on Sunday morning and yes to Jesus on Wednesday night and yes to Jesus at the home fellowship, you also have to say no to the world in the public square. And again, we'll need the Holy Spirit to help us. Remember Peter and John? I love that story. They were in the temple. Jesus had gone to heaven. The church was established. They were preaching and teaching every day, and people were coming to Jesus, and souls were being saved, and folks were being healed, and there was miracles. And the Jewish elite, the Sanhedrin, the ruling class, said, Oh, no, you're not going to preach that gospel. You're not going to do that anymore. So they arrested him and threatened him. Then they got scared after they arrested him and threatened him, so they released him, but they called him in and they said, that's it, fellas, no more of that stuff. Knock it off or you're going to be in serious trouble. And Peter and John, they answered and they said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge, for we cannot but help speak the things which we have seen and heard. They said, no deal. We're not stopping for you just because you don't like it. Now, the key to that story is if you read that entire chapter, chapter 4, you'll see it begins with them ministering, clearly it writes, in the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the key to their courage. And again, that's the key to our strength as well in these declining days, to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. I need His power on my own. I'm like a, you know, a rag doll. I have no strength. But when the Holy Spirit digs into my heart, that's a whole different story. So in my mind, in the 21st century, we as faithful Christians are willing to live in opposition to the ways of the world. Now, I'm not saying we take a baseball bat and break everything that's liberal. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we just need to stand tall and be a light. We not be afraid to say the truth. 
things are going to get more and more challenging in America. And it is interesting. Think about Miriam, Moses' sister. Heck, I don't know how old she was, 14, 13, same age as Jessica, 15. I have no idea. She's just a girl. But she had the faith to say yes to God and no to Egypt, too. What she did was dangerous. She's the one that launched the little, you know, raft out into the water. And then she watched the baby float down and was there when the baby was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and got involved in the rescue and got involved in how the baby would be raised and so forth and so on. Where'd she get that faith? Just a young girl. Well, it can't be inherited. A lot of us older folks wish our kids could just inherit our faith, but it doesn't quite work like that. But it can be enhanced by us, and that's where our responsibility comes in. And that's what Jochebed and Amran did. They enhanced the faith of Marion, and I'm sure Aaron as well. They saw mom and dad in action. Our kids can't inherit it, but they can catch a gulp of it, you know. And they can watch you saying yes to God and no to the world. And then what of Moses himself? He didn't stay a baby. He grew up, got a big beard and everything. <laughs> and he matured and he became a man. And there was a time also when he folded his arms and looked directly into the eye of Pharaoh and all the power of Egypt. And he said, yes to God and no to you. How strong, was brave. Verse 24, check it out. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. Refused the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was determined. His yes was easily seen. It was seen in the challenging decisions that this man had to make. Probably more challenging than anything you and I would ever have to stand before. Even as a member of Pharaoh's own household. In the book of Acts, Stephen, again, if you like to talk about Moses, he wrote these words in Acts 7. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in his words and deeds. So he, well-educated, smart, clever guy. He had everything in Egypt, didn't he? Had education, um, certainly had wealth, status, power, probably more power promised than yet to come. Everything. All the sin of Egypt as well. The slaves, you name it. Everything that that society could offer. And he rejected it all. And he chose instead to share in the oppression and the care of God's people. He said yes to God. He said yes to God's people, and he said no to Pharaoh's Egypt. He turned a blind eye on all that revelry because he knew that earthly pleasure was not his ultimate purpose in life. He knew to pursue that would not bring him any real happiness. What was going to bring him a joy deep in his heart was following God. If he had remained in Egypt, he would have been powerful. Notoriety, diplomat, I don't know. Enjoying the pleasures of sin. But had he done that, he never would have become the servant of God. And there is no higher title than to be called the servant of God. Someday when I die. Some might say, oh, once in a while he gave a good sermon and all, blah, blah, he's a nice guy and came to the hospital and visited me. What I really hope someone would say is that Al was a servant of the Lord. Because that's the most important thing. Verse 27. So he walked out of Egypt. He didn't care. He didn't fear the wrath of Pharaoh. By faith, it says, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him, God, in other words, who is invisible. 
It was a yes to God and a no to Egypt. A yes to God and no to Egypt. Now I need to bring this down and down and make it very personal, very eyeball to eyeball. Is there something that you need to say no to? Come on now. I know you'll need help. You'll need the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you'll need that and even a brother or sister to come. But is there something that you need to say no to? Is there someone that you need to walk away from? I mean, about face walk away from. Now, I'm not talking about a wife and a husband. Sorry, lady. And I'm not talking about a husband from a wife. Those kinds of things need to be carefully and gently and lovingly taken care of in proper fashion. I'm talking about associations, friendships. I remember when I came to Christ, I knew who all my friends were. And as soon as I came to Christ, I realized that that gang of seven, eight, ten guys and gals, I just couldn't be pals with them anymore. I could pray for them, maybe share with them, but I couldn't hang with them anymore. And so God was good, and he provided Becky and I with lots of new friends from Calvary Chapel, and everything was hunky-dory going forward. Is there someone you need to walk away from? So I don't know if I can. God will give you the power to stand up and walk, I promise you, if you ask for it. For sure there were pressures on Moses. Imagine how he felt. Forces there trying to keep him in the palace. Some might even come to him and say, wait, you can't do this. You owe the Egyptians something. You're Pharaoh's daughter. She and then he has saved your life. Some of his associates might have said, wait a minute. You don't need to pull away from here. Stay on the throne, live with us, enjoy Egypt, and help, you know, the Israelites also. What can you do from a tent in Sinai? But Moses said, that's not going to work. He said, I've got to separate myself. I need to <clears throat> cross the Red Sea and get out in the desert and pitch my tent and lead these people. It was a hard decision, but he chose to say yes to God and no to the world. And God bless him for it. Oftentimes, the people that we are most familiar with are often the ones that are the most difficult to walk away from. Yet sometimes, ladies, gentlemen, we just need to do that. And sometimes Christians, and I've had them tell me this, they feel more like a person in the world than a person of faith because they live so close to Egypt or they're in Egypt. Come on, this is the time to move out. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I mean, how much longer can this mess go on before he comes for his church? Let's be real. This is the time to move out of Egypt. It's never too late. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. There you go. You think he's going to deny that prayer request? Oh, I'm not listening to that one. <laughs> of course not. And true faith doesn't weigh the alternatives. It doesn't try to be a mixologist. That's the new fancy term for a bartender. Mix Egypt and God and his kingdom together. It won't work. You can't have one foot over here in Egypt and another foot over here in God's kingdom. Think as soon as the wind blows, boom, you're going down. It just will not work. You have to walk away. Oh, and faith. I have faith. I believe in Jesus. Excellent. Praise the Lord. Do you really believe you're going to heaven? But as the days march on, faith is far more a way of walking, how we walk with the Lord, than it is just talking about the Lord. That's what James said. And saying yes often means you have to walk away from Egypt. Continuing on, verses... 26 and 7 again, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked forward to the reward 
By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He had faith. Christians, it isn't all about just feeling good. We've got to have faith when we don't feel so good. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know that. Those who come to him have to believe, really believe that he is and is the rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. You've got to have faith. You have to believe there is a heaven. You have to believe there is a rapture coming. You have to believe that there is a paradise waiting. You have to believe that there's something so wonderful ahead of us that all of this is just going to absolutely pale into insignificance. He looked ahead. He looked ahead, it says there, to the great reward. I was thinking about the fishermen, you know, the Galilean fishermen. They're out there casting their nets, scrubbing their boat, cutting their bait, whatever they were doing. Jesus said, come follow me. And they stood up, left their boats and nets, and followed Jesus. And I have to believe their other buddies, fishermen, said, hey, where are you going? What's up, Andrew, John? Where, why are you, how come you're? They said, we're just following Jesus. And you know where that took them. What a life those men had. Oh, my gosh. Jesus said, if any man comes after me, he's got to take a pledge. If any man comes after me, he has to deny himself, and that's the pledge. He has to say no. If any man comes after me, he has to deny himself and pick up his cross and follow after me, and Mark adds the word daily. Follow after me daily. It's all about following Jesus. The church of the 21st century has got to get that. It's all about following Jesus. It's not about me feeling really great all the time. It's about me following Jesus. Those around Moses probably were laughing at him. Ridiculous. But to Moses, his assessment of the situation was crystal clear. And so he went from prince of Egypt to friend of God. A decision not unlike, although not as great as, but not unlike, maybe it's a little foretaste really, of the one found in Philippians chapter 2, wherein Jesus is remembered by Paul of making a very determined yes to the Father's will. Being both fully human, fully man, and fully God, Paul says this, Jesus, in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was God, but he made himself of no reputation. He, and he took the form of a bondservant, and he came to earth in the likeness of a man. And being found in the appearance as a man, he went even further. He humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death. And then he adds these last words, even death on the cross, which is the most horrible death that anyone could endure in that time and era. Jesus said yes to the Father. And he said no to everything else, including his own life. Moses chose to suffer with God's people. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He said yes, and there was some suffering involved. I mean, read the story of all the stuff that happened to him out in the wilderness. It wasn't all fun. His own people turned against him a few times. There is pleasure in sin for our flesh, for a season. But with every kick comes a kickback that causes a heartache later. I've seen people give in to the flesh for an hour, and end up with a lifetime of pain. A lifetime of pain. You know, Becky and I have had the blessing of traveling around, pastoring different churches over the past 10 years. I've seen pastors who lost everything. Their wives, their children, their 
churches, their reputation, their future, everything dear to them because they didn't say no to the flesh. My dear brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I don't feel sorry for them because you can say no. Well, it's not that I don't feel sorry for them. You know what I mean. But you can say no to your flesh. Say no to that flirtatious guy if you're a single woman or that flirtatious girl or that habit or that whatever it is, that thought life, whatever. By the power of the Holy Spirit, take a pledge. Say no to that thing, that passion. I don't care what it is. Stand up. Be a woman. Be a man. Don't say you can't. No, I can't. Yes, you can. When you come and you tell me you can't and you're weak, you don't know how to overcome, you're telling me you don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, that you don't believe the Bible. Sure, you might have to experience a little pain now, like an addict who has to withdraw from some drug. Apparently, God is calling. <laughs> He's very pleased. Might be a little awkwardness, a little embarrassment, I guess, maybe. A couple of tough conversations with folks. But a lifetime of peace follows. And that's the choice. Let me tell you this, and we'll kind of finish up here. Life, I have discovered, is built. A good life is built on character, on who you are as a man or a woman or a child. And character is displayed by your decisions. And the decisions you make, which makes your character, are built on your value system. And your value system is based on faith. And faith comes from the Word of God. So you see where it all is? If you're into the Word of God, and you're allowing the pastors here to teach you the Word of God, and you're reading your Bible, and you're living your Bible, your character is going to remain strong and shine brighter and brighter as the days go by. And that's what we want. We want to be a light shining. We want to be a salt that's a preservative. Moses was a man of character because he made the right decisions. And he made the right decisions because of his value system. And his value system was based on faith. And his faith came from listening to God. He didn't even care that Pharaoh was the most powerful man. And he was in jeopardy. I mean, all through those plagues, at any moment in time, Pharaoh could have said, take him out. But you see, he had caught a vision of the greatness of God. And that's what Christians need to do. We need to catch a vision of how great God is and how great eternity is going to be. And having that kind of vision is the perfect antidote for the fear of men. Yes, men stand up in front of us, but we have a vision that goes far beyond this thing that's standing right in front of us or this comment from this, you know, talking head on TV or what this man said or that man said. We have a vision that's much bigger. We can boldly say, as Paul wrote to the Hebrews, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Say yes to God. That's what he was telling these fellows to do, and women. Forget that Judaism and legalism and things that will make life a little smoother with you with all the other folks around town. And sadly, the people in that first century Jewish church would start it off with such a bang. They were fainting. And they had fears, and it was all weighing them down. And so they thought it would be easier for them if they act a little bit more like Jews or act a little bit more like accepted society. And they were tempted to stop standing up strong. Even some were quitting the faith. Don't be afraid, my dear brothers and sisters. That's the message here. Have faith in God. He's going to see you through. There is no temptation that can overtake you. 
that God can't deal with. So let us lay aside every weight and every sin, Hebrews 12, which so easily ensnares us. Why should it so easily does? But it can. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then my wife's favorite verse, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Choices. We have the freedom to choose. It's a wonderful freedom. But a real measure of a woman's character and a real measure of a man's character is what he chooses not to do. Not to do. And that kind of greatness in the last analysis is always courageous. My dear friends, do you have a decision that you need to make? Yesterday was an interesting day. What a day. It was a big memorial service here. It was held on behalf of Mark Malanga, a brother in this church. And during the course of the service, I made no effort at all, 450 people here or something, I made no effort at all to water down the gospel, what Mark believed, what I believed, what people need to believe. I mean, I laid it out, frankly, to the best of my ability. And when my turn was over, and hopefully we had comforted Zenda and the family, and I think we did, I sat down. Then my son-in-law, Raj, got up here, and I was blown away because I thought I was really bold in saying the truth. But he was emboldened even more. He was kind, he was warm, he was smiling, he was loving. But he was putting it out there. He was putting the gospel out for all these people. And then he went a step further than I have ever done at a memorial service. He offered Christ to the point of saying, if you'd like to receive Christ today, put your hand up. And to, I don't know how many people did. It's not important. The question I have, though, is all the people said yes. They were moved. They were moved because of Mark's testimony, Zenda's testimony. A um, couple of fellas talked about Mark for a couple of minutes early on. I shared for 40 minutes about Christ and Mark and the Lord and, you know, put that whole little, I weave that thing together and then Raj get up. They were moved. They raised their hand. The question is, was their yes determined? Or are they going to look to come back and hear the word of God? Or are they going to go to one of the other great churches in this community and slide in there and start hearing God's word and worshiping the Lord and fellowshipping him? Was their yes a real pledge? Is your yes? a real pledge. Maybe you have a decision to make. Has your decision, yes, also been kind of a maybe? And it can't be that way. Will you say no to the world and yes to Jesus? You have to make the right decisions. And the right decision will help you through the whole process. They got to the Red Sea, didn't they? Boy, the Egyptians, boy, they're barreling down on them, gleaming swords and spears. Going to kill them all. The ocean's in front of them. What do they do? By faith, Moses goes across the ocean, and all the children of Israel run after him. And they get all the way across. And the Egyptians go, we can catch them. And they start running across. And what does God do? Gone. God will take care of you. Won't always be easy. Maybe some challenges. Might get a little mud on your feet. Might lose a bag or some luggage along the way. But you'll get to the other side. He'll take care of you. You see, when you're at the end of your rope, that's the perfect time to trust Jesus. When you need a miracle, when you need something amazing, that's the perfect moment to cast all your cares upon the Lord with the knowledge that he cares 
for you. My friends, what shall we say to these things if God is for us? Come on, who can be against us? He created everything. He didn't even spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us. How shall we not freely serve him? Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, more than we would ever ask or think. Give it all to Jesus. I'm afraid. No, no, no. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. So do you have the faith to say no to the world and yes to Jesus? I thought I heard somebody just ask me a question. How do I do that, Pastor Al? <laughs> Three ways. You recognize and you repent, and you receive. You recognize it's time for me to make a pledge of allegiance and say yes to Jesus Christ. You recognize that. Something's happened this morning. You recognize that. To re-pledge, recommit, I don't know, whatever you want to say. Secondly, it's time to repent and say no to that old life. No more. I need your help, Lord. Give me power, but no more of that. And then you receive by faith the love of God, the forgiveness of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's all you have to do. Recognize, repent, and receive. And it all happens at once in the blink of an eye that fast. Join with me in prayer.